Um, so welcome everybody to this last uh, webinar for advanced users of Historiana. Today's topic is reformation or reformations, and it will be led by our um, trainer today, Heis van Hans, who is a teacher trainer at the Fontys University of Applied Science in Tilburg, Netherlands. Um, Heis studied uh, history and religious studies, and we'll talk today about working with change and continuity. So please, guys, go ahead. Thank you, Lorraine. First of all, I think you uh, you have nailed the Dutch G in your pronunciation. I think that uh, my, my name is typically Dutch, and, and you can hear your you have been living here because that's one of the most difficult letters to for for people <laughs> to pronounce. Yeah, double so, yes, ones as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of them. So again, my name is Gijs Gans. I'm a teacher trainer at the Fontys University of Applied Sciences uh, at the um, uh, teacher training educational uh, uh, departments of religious education and history. Um, and I'm also uh, a, a member of the Euroclio Historiana learning team. Uh, so I would like, you, would like to take you I would like to do this webinar on uh, working with change and continuities, but I would like to discuss also some content on the Reformation. But uh, before we get started on the more theoretical part of this presentation, this webinar, I'd like to ask you some questions using the Mentimeter tool. Let me just see if I can skip that. Okay. If you could all go to menti.com and fill in the code, that's provided here. I think that it's also already there in the chat, right? Okay. And there are some questions for you. First question, the second question. Uh, and if you could please answer those. So the first question is when you teach about the Reformation, what topics would you certainly discuss in class? Okay, has that everyone got the chance to put in Oh, no. More still coming. Okay, so what I'm seeing here are some things that I think I would definitely also uh, discuss when teaching this subject. So the change, continuity in religion, uh, the situation before Luther, Luther, uh, Martha Luther himself, uh, the reformers who influenced Martha Luther, amongst which probably Jan Hus. Uh, the role power of politics plays in, 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 in the Reformation, and uh, especially one of the later actors in, 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 in the Reformation, Henry VIII. Okay, now I want to ask you a next question. I'm going to tell you why I asked this later. And the second question is if this works. The second question is if you would create a timeline of the Reformation in which year? Would your timeline start? Okay, so most of you put down 1517, some of you 1500, 1510, beginning of the 16th century. And one of the participants said 1054, the Great Schism. Okay. Um, why did I ask you this question? It's just to see. Uh, what images we have already of the Reformation. I'm going to skip back to my presentation. So the subject is the early Reformation. And uh, based on a few uh, scholarly works, I wanted to discuss the Reformation before Luther. Um, two works are very important in my thinking on this subject. Right? And the first one is by Linda Woodhead. This is actually the uh, main book we used when I uh, studied religious studies myself, which is the Introduction to Christianity by Linda Woodhead. Now, Linda Woodhead is not a historian. Linda Woodhead is a sociologist. Uh, although she writes uh, Introduction to Christianity, which is historical. She starts with the beginnings and de describes the developments until the modern times. Now, one thing that her work stresses is that, uh, as she says, there is always what she calls a religion from below. And her main argument is that reforms in the Christian churches all over the world 
um, can be perceived as a continuous characteristic of Christianity. Her main argument is that there has never been a unified church. In every epoch of Christian history, there was always uh, an institutional power to try to tell the other people, the, the, the normal Christians, if you will, what to believe, what to think, but they were never successful. There was always a movement from below that tried to come up with new creative ways of understanding what Christianity meant, what being Christian meant. And she says that has been going on since the beginning of the first churches, right? There was always diversity and every time uh, an institution tried to limit that diversity, new movements sprang up from below. And in her discussion of the Reformation, she, she tries to make clear that this is just, in the beginning, one of the many different new, uh, uh, new currents that try to break free from a more oppressive church from above. Now, the second book I'd like to discuss is this one from Kyle, Carlos Ari. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm just pronouncing his name right. And, and his World book was called Reformations, the early modern world from 1450 to 1650. So this is a very much an historical narrative, an historical work. Um, but his main conclusions align with that of Linda Woodhead, because what he notes is that the process of change that led to this Protestant Reformation started in the Middle Ages and very early on in the Middle Ages and continued in both the Western denominations after 1517. His main argument is that Luther and the Protestants didn't break free from an existing church, but rather that different uh, movement that tried to change the church break, broke free from each other after 1517. So it's not that we have one major Catholic church that dated back to the antiquity, but okay, there is something that changed in this period, and from that change, two different streams arose, right? Two different streams that were both not, um, you know, continuation of the medieval church. And he tries to understand what happens. And a big part of his book is discussing the earlier reformers. And he starts very early. He starts also with St. Francis, people like St. Francis of Assisi, uh, he said, but if we look at those earlier reformers, even the Cathars are, could be perceived as early reformers. People who wanted to change Christianity from uh, a belief that was based on rituals, that was based on uh, church services, to a more personal and more direct and more practical Christianity that was all about serving your neighbor, of being humble. Right? And it says that is a process that is going on, has been going on at least since about 1100 AD. So if a lot of people say we'll start by 1517, Iris says, no, I'm going to pull that date way back. Right. So the early modern world starts from 1450. That is when a lot of the developments started to, to uh, become a bit faster, the developments uh, phased up. But if we look at the forerunners of those developments, we can place them very early on in the high Middle Ages. Right? And even things like reading the Bible in vernacular languages, he said there are people, early reformers, who urged for uh, more accessibility of the biblical text, right? even in the Western churches. So taking these two in account, and we have this very good source collection made by our colleagues of the content team for Historiana on uh, precursor to the reformations, uh, I thought this would be the ideal topic for working with change of continuity. Right? Because what most of our students still think, even uh, my students, is that 1517 is the watershed, right? Then when it actually all started, there were some earlier developments, but Luther is, 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 is the moment and everything changes. And that is something that historically can be discussed if, to what extent that is true, right? So we could try to make them think about long-term changes. 
And I think that this exercise of thinking about change and continuity provides also an opportunity to get some better understanding of a long-term societal change in general. Right? How do things change? Do thing, things change suddenly, suddenly or do things change for, over a long period of time? As historians, we know that both are true, but that change often changes pace, changes direction, right? And that turning points are often understood as parts of a long, longer term change. Um, and I think that this is something we could, people could benefit even in thinking about new problems, modern problems, right? How did the environment change? Is it something that has happened rapidly or is it something that is a long-term change? How can we understand that? How can we understand uh, troubles within multicultural societies, right? Is it something that happened because uh, people started coming in from Syria or is there a long-term process of uh, integration or field integration whatsoever. So I think that this, this, this core capability in history, working with change and continuity is also very relevant for our daily lives. Now working with change and continuity has some challenges and I would like to discuss them and also uh, provide some, some, some first remedies in working with that. Because my students, uh, probably your students as well, uh, even my students at the training, uh, teacher training university, but also those at, at the high school, they found working with the change of continuity sometimes very difficult. You know, there are some things that uh, we can uh, see in, 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 in more like pedagogical literature that could help us understand what those difficulties are. Uh, this is uh, a model of historical reason, right? Because change of continuity are two elements to, to, to concept that are very much uh, an important pair in the idea of historical reasoning. This is just one model, one, the model that has been widely used in the Netherlands. And I think that it's also present in some documents from Europeo. So I hope that uh, some of you are familiar with that. If not, uh, the article on which it's based, it's a very a good read. It's a difficult article, but it's very relevant because it, it is the, one of the first attempts to understand what do students need to know and to be able to, which skills do they need to come to their own understanding of history. So understanding about continuity and change, cause and consequences, similar and differences. It, and it, it, it needs at least some historical knowledge an interest in history, very important some epistemological beliefs, beliefs on what we think is true, how we decide what is true in history, but also some knowledge of meta-historical concepts and strategies. And those strategies and concepts, they contain the knowledge of how to analyze and interpret historical phenomena and sources and how to construct evidence-based arguments. Now, this is where we find in most literature, the concepts of change and continuity. There are concepts that are very unique or very relevant at least to, to, to history because we as historians we try first to understand change as to understand change right what did change how did it change so change and continuity and cause of consequence are very much related concepts and they are the bread and butter of what we do as historians uh, but these are not very easy concepts uh, because most people, even if they didn't have any history education, uh, they, 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 of course, they understand what we mean with change and continuity. And of course, they think about causes and consequences. But there is a difference between what we call, at least in, in the Netherlands, the unschooled thinking about them and the schooled thinking about them. And the unschooled thinking about those concepts is very much naive, if you will. Well, the schooled is more complex and so forth. And that development from a more naive understanding of these concepts to a more schooled and abstract and uh, intricate understanding is something they can only learn at school. Because what problems do they have with uh, challenges, well, I might say, with change of continuity? Well, first of all, I find that my students understand change of continuity as opposites, right? 
they don't understand them as being interwoven. Both exist together. It's not that there is just change or just continuity, right? Something change, something stay the same. And my students, when they start doing history, they want to know, but sir, is it, is it a matter of change or is it a matter of continuity? And we have to train them to send them, a, no, they're both present. The question is, how do they relate to each other? How do they work with each other, right? What does change? What, 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 what does stay the same? How can we relate it to each other? So this is the first challenge. The second challenge I found is that my students believe that change is a single short-term effect, right? If I discussed uh, even in the higher levels of secondary schools, the Reformation, most people say 1517, that's the start. Then what, that's the big change. And they often view that everything was not peachy before that, but there was not really big problems and discussions going on in the medieval church. And Luther, he was a brilliant man. He knew exactly, but this is what we were doing wrong. People started to think, oh, he might have a point. And then the whole, uh, the whole reformation started. Right? Um, of course, as historians, we know that is not the case. Right? Change is historically conceived as a process with various paces and patterns that even those changes and uh, paces and patterns change over time. Um, so we have to learn them, to perceive change as something that is continuous, that uh, sometimes has a faster pace, sometimes a slower pace. Uh, sometimes the changes are more economical or the political or cultural, and each of them have different timelines, right? So the political changes are often more short term, while the cultural change is, it tend to be more long term changes. So this is something that they, they, they often struggle with. The third one is that they need to understand that progress and decline are not facts, right? Um, the fact that we in the West have created a better life, more food security than, and more hygiene and Look at the, 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 the speed in which we developed the vaccines to the COVID virus. This is something that we should be proud of. But to say that is just progress, right? And that's a fact and everybody should accept that. That is something that a historian probably would not say, okay, that is, of course, there are patterns of progress, but there is also decline, right? The way we produce our food, the way we produce, we, we, we organize our livelihoods also have a lot of effect and a lot of impact on the ecology, right? So it's not just the progress, it's always progress and decline. What we tend to think of as progress decline is an evaluation that we make. It's an opinion, it's not a fact. And even this is something that my students struggle with. Last thing I want to mention is that change, historical change, uh, is something that the people who live through the change often did not understand, especially when change is taking a longer time to occur. People do not understand change while they're in the middle of it, right? Most of the time. Um, did the people who um, experienced the, the paleological uh, evolution, revolution, understand what they were going through the way that we do? Probably not, because it was taking too much time. Right? Students think that they must have been aware that things were changing. They cannot understand that being part of history just means that you, you don't have the same distance in reasoning about history. So if we want to work with change and continuity as concepts, these are some major challenges. Right? Students can learn to address these challenges but we need to help them. That's where we come in as teachers. Um, the literature provides us with some remedies, right? So there are different activities that have been developed to address the issues. For one thing, and a major one, and I think that's something that we all could recognize in our own teaching is 
the use of timelines and period, periodization. Right? Why do we, as historians, often tend to uh, let students develop timelines? Because timelines organizes at least the different occurrences in, in time. Right? If we have a timeline, we say, okay, but this happened and then happened, so might there be some, some change and what might stay the same? The same goes with periodization, right? We talk about antiquity, we talk about Middle Ages, the early modern period, the modern period. These are all just tools for understand, okay, but now antiquity stops, right? And, and, and the medieval period starts. Was that a big um, sudden movement? No, there is a, a definite decline of the, at least the Western Roman Empire, which gradually transformed into medieval Western Europe. Right? It's not that there's just one point that everybody said, okay, we're done with antiquity, now we start living in a new era. No, it's something that the people themselves were not aware of. It goes gradually. But we make a periodization, say, okay, but now you can distinguish the two. This one might help them to understand, okay, but there is some change that has occurred. The second strategy is uh, something we probably have done ourselves. Uh, but we might also let students do is sequencing the historical facts or the historical occurrences in stories in order to construct a narrative. Right? So when we talk about history, when we tell historical tales, we actually are trying to organize facts uh, by uh, explaining what did change, why it did change, and so forth. There's a very natural way of trying to understand the change. If we can let students form their own narratives, we might challenge them to take into account different aspects as we have talked before. The third one is asking questions on the nature of change and continuity in specific period. Right? If you look at the evidence, do you think there is more change or more continuity? Right, And try to, to address the, the issues, um, at least try to address their own, uh, would you say that, their own uh, ideas before they came into the classroom. Try to challenge what they have, think they already know. Right? If we think that the Reformation started in 1517, stress that there has been a much longer development leading up to that. And the last one, and I think the most interesting one is one that we're going to try to, 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 to work with ourselves is a living graph. A living graph is a timeline, uh, for those people who are not familiar with, with that, that activity, is a timeline, but a timeline on which we try to uh, put the, 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 the events to the person on different positions uh, to the timeline. So if we have a normal timeline, it's flat, it's, it's just two dimensional, right? Um, we have the dates, we have the different events and they're all on the same length, the same level. If you put those events on different levels, you might relate them to each other. And this is something I want to, uh, I, I want to, 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 um, to work with in the next activity, which I've presented, uh, uh, prepared for you. But before we go into the uh, activity and the breakout rooms, I did see there were some things in the chat. Are there any questions? Just look at the chat. Hey, okay. Hi, may I just ask a question? Do yeah, you sure. mean um, with a living graph like parallel timelines? Parallel timelines? Yeah, could be if you if you have a timeline for two different uh, social groups, for example, or two different countries, and you put them on the same uh, timeline but with different colors. That could be a parallel. That could definitely work. Yeah, mm -hmm. is that okay. what you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so the main point in 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 change and continuity, I think that is that we need to recognize that these are very difficult uh, concepts. Right? And I think that if I look at my own development, I only learned working with them by doing history, by reading, by writing papers, by thinking about them, being challenged by my own professors to, to think 
differently than I did before, right? And to take to account different aspects of the change of continuity. Uh, what I found in, in especially in, in the Dutch textbooks, right? Is that there is a text that tells them what changed and what stayed the same. You know? But telling people, by telling students what has changed and what is going to do, or what, what remained the same, what changed, they cannot work with the concept. So we, they would probably not develop a more um, a more nuanced view on the concepts. Therefore, I think we should, should work with them. One more question. Sure. So would you say that uh, the concept of uh, similarity and difference are very important in creating the living graph? Could be, depending on your question, yeah. Yeah, I think that if, if you look at the, the, um, the e-learning activity we're going to concentrate on today, Difference and similarity is a very uh, big part of it, yeah. But with, with difference and similarities as well, it's not that, you know, the, sa the same thing goes for change of continuity. It's not that something is similar or different, right? They're both, right? And, 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 and working like that with those concepts would allow students to, to get a better grasp and more higher thinking skills in history, I guess. So yeah, it's a very so, good. Mm -hmm. So I would, I, I think if we talk about changing continuity, we are also talking on another level of similarities and differences because change means difference, continuity means similarities, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I would, I would there are different, um, different lists of the main uh, uh, meta-historical concepts. Uh, I find it difficult to say that that one is is better than the others because they they usually uh, you know point to the same problems, right? So I think that if you use the concepts right, that work for you, that is the best thing, right? I, I I prefer the big six from 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 Sykes and Morton, but it's something that that works for me. But there are a lot, a lot of different lists, right? So it's it's, uh, it's not that there is one definite way of understanding these. Uh, I think the most important thing is is to understand. Okay, it's it's, it's working concept, right? And and try to work with that. I see one new message before we go to the breakout rooms. Okay, what is the target audience for this activity? A very good question. Would it all, uh, this already fit with a twelve year old? Um, I think uh, my time. Um, I th I think. I would try it with 12 year olds, but uh, you should look if, if there is not too much uh, historical contact in, in the, the fact sheets that I'm going to present you, because I think that the uh, level of content in this, in this, uh, in this activity, because Martijn is, a, is, a, is an ex-student of mine, so I know where he works. I think this for the Dutch system, this is too much content. But you could, you could see if it works. I don't think it's necessarily too difficult, but I think it's too much context for what is normal within the Dutch context. Okay. Um, Lorraine, could I, we have, we, some more people have entered, right? So we're now 12. So there's 10 participants and two of us, right, Lorraine? That's right. Ah, okay. Um, would it be an option to create three breakout rooms? with two of three persons and two of four, would that be, or we could do four of three? We can... maybe, the last, maybe the last one is better. There's three breakout rooms of three, and then we have four, that would work. Breakout, four breakout rooms of three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No problem. Um, before, while Lorraine does the technical bit, um, <laughs> I'm going to show you my laptop wants to work with me. I'm going to show you the activity itself. There are going to, there's going to be a link. So the question is, who was the first true medieval reformator? And just to, uh, the instructions are also on the page, but you get a number of fact sheets of early medieval reformators. Now, the first thing you need to do is you put them on the timeline. I could not in the tool get a better timeline than this. But if you put them on the timeline, the chronological order, then you have to compare them. And if you think that they differ enough from each other, 
you put the right one a little a level a little bit above the other so that you can see when the big changes arrive i hope that's clear in the uh, instruction as well but this is how the the, the, the major part of the e-learning activity goes. So you have a lot of reformators, put them in the chronological order, and try, then try to understand or try to assess, okay, how much does this one differ from the one beforehand? Okay. Are the, okay, let's see one more question. Sorry about talking about significance. Uh, could be, but we're also talking about change. How much did it change? The significance, I would say, how important is the change? So that could be, but just try to understand in what level uh, does the ideas of this reformator differ from the one before him? I'm going to open the breakout rooms then. Okay. Uh, how long should I set them for? Um, I think half an hour would be nice. more than sufficient. If people right. are maybe earlier, we could call them back. Okay. Great. Here we go then. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hi, sir. You're muted. I, I see you talk, but uh, I'm afraid I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can now. Yes. Udu was, okay. was, was making a very valid point. He was uh, cut off in the middle, uh, I guess. Maybe, Uta, you could, to the, to the rest of the group, you could, could explain what you were trying to say because I thought you were raising a valid um, point. So, the one issue I had was that um, I think the first activity of, um, of um, the whole task and um, there was a problem with saving my results, let's say, moving the people, uh, the, the different um, voices, if you want, on, on, on a different level, because I went then on to the to the last activity, and then um, because that needs really the information from what is activity three or four on the previous slide, so, and that was not safe. So that's something that we need to have in mind, so that um, if you do changes or if you do activities, whether we need to click a save button because we then need to move on to use this uh, information in the, in the next activity. So that's something I think we should have in mind um, for, uh, for the, the e-learning platform. Yeah, and I, I believe that my time had the same problem. I had all these things worked out. I was proud of what I did and then I would try to go back and then everything was still a mess. All right. So that, I think that's a very valuable, very valuable, valuable remark. Maybe we should see if there is there's a possibility to 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 freeze the screen, to print the screen, or to save the progress you already have. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, or in the meantime, until that has been fixed, that you somewhere in the exercise know that, or that you tell, okay, hey. Uh, if you yeah. go go on, you cannot go back or make a screenshot or whatever. So up until it has been fixed in in the software, that it's uh, that you know beforehand. <laughs> yeah, de definitely, definitely a valid point. So I will, I will change that in in uh, for now. Uh, make a sc print screen because you cannot save it and things will get lost. But we need to discuss if there is a possibility to, to add a different function to the to the platform. Okay, valid point. Um, uh, I'm going to, to return later on to, to Ute because she, she, she said something that made me think and she, she provided me with some ideas to, 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 to really improve on another point, but maybe other people want to react. What are your first ideas or even questions about the, the activity? Uh, we said uh, that uh, in, um, oh, uh, we said uh, that uh, there are some holes in the characters because at the end you have one century without any character because we stop with Francis and start again with Wycliffe. There is one century of time without any character 
probably I, I suggest uh, I say good Italian Fradolcino da Novara uh, that uh, is uh, for example a middle uh, heresiarch er er between uh, Francis and uh, uh, or the variation the spirituals that are a part of Francisca movement like Michele da Cesena they became uh, they try to change more politically and also uh, Willem of Hockham uh, and so on probably they are and also we guess we said about women there are yeah. no women in that source collection and yeah. so this is a real problem and so some Caterina Idegard from Bing and Caterina von Siena uh, they are very important they were very important in the middle ages and they try mm -hmm. to change something in the church in the Christianity so I think that they can have also Eloise we said uh, at a certain <laughs> point uh, with Abelard because they are a real couple uh, it's not only uh, Abelard so they we had to put something uh, prob probably in these two sides of the yeah. activity yeah uh, could I ask you to uh, mention the people you mentioned in the chat because my Italian is not so good that I can write down the names that you just mentioned. Okay. Any other remarks, questions? If I may, what, what I like about the activity is really that um, as a student, you have to uh, come up with a really good argumentation as to why you would put somebody higher or lower and because um, the, the, let's say, the, 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 the ideas of the various um, reformers or the, they are a mixture of, on the one hand, what we would call more traditional or more backward, at the same time progressive. And I think it's a very good exercise for students to understand that you have at the same time, as you mentioned before, you have some progressive streaks or progressive, uh, progressive strands. At the same time, you have some um, very traditional or conservative strands. And um, this um, ambiguity, if you want, or the parallel of the two strands is, is really interesting. And this can be disturbing for students. But we were talking, um, the question I always have is, is change automatically progress? And that's a very interesting point to look at. So at the one hand, we have people who have a very progressive approach in some questions, but at the same time, in other questions, they have a rather traditional approach. And I think that is very interesting and uh, for students to understand that it is something that, um, that might be hard for students to actually um, to compromise on and to, to come up with the decision, do I consider this person as a more progressive person or do I consider this person as a more um, well, backward person or more traditional person or conservative person? And I think the whole the, the whole question of um, progressive progressiveness versus traditionality is a very interesting question. And I think it's it's good for students to be aware that there are very different perspectives and that you cannot judge um, someone's uh, or someone by Oh, you cannot make generalizations. You have to have a very uh, diverse, if you want, or a um, a very complex view of somebody. And I think that's very interesting for students. And that's not only interesting for the question of reformation, but it's interesting for a variety of questions. Yeah. I think your your remark on on trying to get them to think of people that try to categorize them as being conservative progressive is a very interesting one. Um, what you said earlier is you mentioned that, you know, there, there are different subjects in change and different uh, elements in change, like the, the use of uh, vernacular or the use of uh, religious texts by, by, by lay people, uh, the uh, education of the priests. Would it be too much to to ask them to compare those, right? Because you said conservative, progressive, that could be a very helpful. Is it okay? Could you describe the change in thinking about the the, the usefulness of using uh, 
religious texts to 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 educate lay people would that be uh, something that they could could um, analyze and see where the change in in that point is or would that take would that make it too complex in total yeah i agree at the same time i think you have to be careful not to um to sort of uh, use our current perspective on things mm -hmm. in evaluating um, the changes at the time. So there is this dichotomy, if you want, of um, how we as, as, as modern historians or as teachers look at the events back then. So how do we look at things in the context, in the contemporary context? And I think that's also something uh, very difficult for students sometimes. Mm. Um, and I just had a very interesting um, essay to Mark today about the role of women in the 1920s. And um, it's very interesting how that you have this overlay of perspectives. And um, it's important, I think, for students to understand, to look at things in, their, in the context of when they happened and not to uh, judge events, or maybe, maybe not, to judge events with our current uh, values, with our current views. And I think that's quite an interesting um, um, discussion you can also have with students in your class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so if we want to, for example, take conservative and progressive as a, as, as a point of departure, only use those subjects if the discussion might challenge modern notions of that those concepts themselves without reinforcing them that the protestants are more modern the catholics are more conservative right? yeah so it should challenge the way they view the concepts themselves instead of yeah. using modern day notions to exactly to project yeah. them uh, yeah and um, i mean were people at the time aware of of how progressive they might have been so Mm -hmm. How would people see themselves in, in their context, in their time? Because I think the biggest danger is uh, if we as, as, as contemporary now uh, use our perspective on evaluating actions and decisions at the time. I think that's that dichot that, um, yeah, how do I say this? This conflict is actually quite an interesting one. Yeah, I would gather that the, the entire notion of progress uh, is a modern notion. So even, even the, the concepts as we use them of, of, of progressive and conservative is, is, is something that is, that is quite modern. I don't think that, that, that St. Francis would have considered himself a progressive. Absolutely. He was a true Christian. So the question would then be, I mean, if you put it on another level with your students, the question would be how how valid are our modern concepts yeah, cool. in, uh, in, in judging or in evaluating um, historical developments? Should we do that? Or is this not adequate? Okay. Any other questions or remarks? before we close off. Uh, yeah, I was just, uh, I, I nearly forgot what I was about to ask <laughs> during the great discussion. Um, yeah, I was just thinking a bit about, about the amount of prior knowledge you, you need for, for this activity, um, for, for just for spe so gee, specific mm. one. Um, I think it, it does help to have uh, already a, a, a concept of quite a few of these people uh, to, to be able to rank them in a in, in certain way. So that was just something I was um, thinking about, okay, how, how much knowledge do these students already need before they can actually start with this kind of activity? And what happens if certain students have a higher uh, knowledge of that specific topic or, um, yeah, that was something, uh, I, I, yeah something that I was just thinking about. Good question. I think that students who have more and, and, and more deep content knowledge will profit in a historical reason. Right? So, so, so knowledge is not enough 
to reason historically, but we, we need that. And the more you have, the easier the reasoning becomes. Uh, so some students will probably do better. We'll probably uh, will probably be able to 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 make different and better analysis, right? Uh, but we need, and I think that's a valid point. We need like a, a sort of baseline in knowledge, but, but people need to understand this. Um, I think that they should at least have some knowledge of the history of the later Middle Ages, and especially church state. Uh, uh, relations between them. I think that's a very important point. And you might say they need conscious knowledge of the, the, the actors themselves. I would not think that would be necessary, but they knew, need to understand that uh, there is a church that tries to, at least the institutional church from Rome, that tries to get more of a grip on local people. That's something that they need to, 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 to take into account. Um, maybe even the, the Western schism, right? That they know that there is, there is something going on in, in, in the Western church. Uh, so I, I would suggest you would do this as, uh, as an activity that would transfer from the Middle Ages to the modern period, right? Because at least in my, my own uh, experience as a teacher, you have one chapter, medieval times, then you have the next chapter, Reformation, early modern times. And this could be an, an, an activity to say, but these are not actually two different subjects. There's not, not just a completely different world. There is something of a continuity between them, right? So then they have, would have all the content models of the later Middle Ages. And you could use that to try to, to, to get them to know, to think about, okay, but how does this relate to the work uh, we are going to discuss later on by Luther, for example. So yes, I would have thought uh, the late Middle Ages, especially. Yeah. I think I agree with you because uh, we tend to um, boxify different periods rather than seeing that there's a really discontinuity. Um, and I think it's important for students to understand, I completely agree with you, that there is, there's a, a fluidity if you want. So it's not something that stops at one point um, at a specific date, and then uh, something new starts at that specific date. Of course, we have turning points, we have important events, but I think this idea of, uh, of really having these, comp these compartments of specific historical epochs or periods is really, um, it's uh, it's not correct. So we have, in my opinion, so we have this continuity, we have this fluidity. And I think that is maybe something also that students find sometimes difficult to understand that we, we cannot shop uh, history in certain really well-defined periods, but that we have this continuity. But I think that's a challenge. and. And that's an interesting challenge for the teachers. Yeah. I think that that's, that's one of the major challenges in, 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 in thinking also about change, right? It's not that it's clear cut, neatly uh, categorized time, time frames. It's, it, it's messy, right? Maybe, maybe the best part of history is that it's messy, right? Uh, needs, needs, needs interpretation, needs thinking. And um, in, in my experience, even in my own teaching as, as a high school teacher, we, we tend to uh, concentrate on, 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 on transferring content, which is this leads to these clear cut timeframes. Uh, maybe this, this might help us, at least something like this might help us to, to engage our students with thinking about change and thinking about the messiness of history. Any other questions or remarks? There's a comment in the chat about okay. how, um, oh, maybe you can read it, but uh, how the, the first true reformer is um, Martin Luther Ulrich Singley and John Calvin, maybe we can talk about that. And Okay, the, I see that in, in, it's by Luzim, if I pronounce the name correctly. 
uh, that the, the true reformers are Martin Luther, uh, Swingley, Calvin, um, because their movement led it to uh, led it by them change the religious map of Europe. Um, of course, this is this is a valid uh, a valid understanding of change. Uh, I'm not saying this is this is this is this is incorrect. Uh, I would argue that uh, I would like to understand my students in not only in political sense because in political sense you're right. Right, in, coming from the Netherlands, right, we 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 have a clear cut difference in religion between the south and the north. The north is Protestant. The south is predominantly Catholic, Roman Catholic. So that division after the Reformation became clear in our own country. So I, I agree that politically, you're right. But I would like to understand, my students understand, but what was the major difference in, in, in the, 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 the major improvement or change that Luther made in, his, in, in, in the, the Christian thinking? What was his main contribution? Right. And most of my students would argue that he was against, um, oh, I cannot remember my time. Could you help me? Off lot with this entangles. Indulgences. Uh, indulgences. Indulgences, yes. So it was, a, it was against indulgences, but that was not the core of, of Luther's teaching. And if you look at what Luther, how Luther development, that he has so much in common with those earlier reformations, right? that they can say, but Luther, it, it's more politically, is right, but, but, but theologically, it's, 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 it's a bit, more nuanced than that. So I would not argue against that. Of course, they are in, in, in an institutional way or in a political way, the most important reformers, but theologically, there is something to be discussed. Is, is Lucy still present? Or? Yes, I'm, I'm ah, here. Good Marcy. afternoon. Yeah, yes. good afternoon. Yes, I, uh, uh, yes, I, I agree with you about the, the new things that uh, Luther brought in uh, with uh, his theory. Yeah. And uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the new things Luther brought is uh, that uh, the believer could, uh, could have a tie with God directly. So could uh, read the Bible directly without uh, any explanation by the, the church, from the church, from the priests. One thing by, uh, by Martin Luther. But I think he, that, yeah, sorry. Sorry for interrupting you. And uh, the other thing, it's a, a, another great contribution, uh, not only from the religious uh, view, but uh, in other aspects, cultural, is that uh, he translated the Bible in German. And uh, so he gave the possibility, the opportunity to all the Germans, all the people, to read the Bible and uh, to, so to make a, a communion, a connection with uh, God. I, I agree that, that, that he did that. Although, this is a strong moment in Luther's theory, I think. Yeah, but I think that Wycliffe did the same thing. Uh, yes, two yes. centuries before he translated. It's his, what John. Yes, yes, it's true. It's true. But uh, uh, so uh, his story gave the chance uh, to to Luther, not to Wycliffe. Well, in my opinion, well, I, I agree that Luther is the one who really changed the, the map of Europe. But why did Luther get that chance? Is that because he was theologically more uh, developed or was it that the political it, it situation full, in Europe? It, yes, both, both of them are many factors, I think. Because it was the historical moment, the change, uh, the, in, the interests of uh, German uh, German princes or German, uh, so. But uh, the, the Luther's theory is so ninety-five uh, thesis of Luther. Mm -hmm. So in in nowadays, it's a it's a difficult text mm -hmm. to 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 read to understand to 
to make interpretations. It's a serious uh, one. It's a serious theory. It's a full mm -hmm. theory. So, in my opinion, so mm -hmm. it's my opinion. Uh, before we had uh, this Dominican or Franciscan orders or Jan Hus or you said John Wycliffe, but uh, they are so partial. They have a contribution, absolutely, it's true, mm -hmm. but uh, their, their contribution is partial. I, I agree, but, but um, you know, as historians, um, there are different opinions in history. Some yes, historians to say, listen, Luther was not that important. And as a teacher, uh, I, I think we have two options in teaching this. Uh, you might, and I think that, that, that is relevant in a lot of contexts, you, you might tell them the story about Luther and try to, to make them understand the importance of a person like Luther. I think that's, that's a valid way of approaching. It would not be my approach. Because, you know, as a historian, I know there are different ways of viewing that. And I would say I would like to let my students make up their own mind on that so that they can understand, okay, but how, how important would you think Luther is? But again, that is, that, it's not to say that, that, that you know, expressing the validity of, of, of the, 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 the significance of Luther is a bad, is, is teaching bad history, but it would not be my approach. I would, would try to let my students find out for themselves. Yes, yes, of course, uh, you are yeah. quite right. Yes, of course, it's uh, it's okay because uh, uh, we have uh, maybe the so we we must uh, give the the chance to the students to to know facts, historical yeah. facts, historical sources, and uh, they can make interpretations. So I, I agree with you totally in at this point, and I and about the historical competencies and key concepts as the continuity and the change, uh, I agree totally yeah. with you because they are very important concepts. And uh, by studying uh, since the first uh, schisma in uh, yeah. eleven in the middle of eleventh uh, century yeah. until until modern age, we can find the process a uh, continuous process. And uh, the, the final result, uh, in my opinion, is uh, this, uh, this new map of Europe, uh, uh, religious map of Europe, uh, after the reformations, as we used to say, uh, after the beginning of the 16th century. I, I agree with you that that is a very important topic to discuss. Uh, the, yes, of the, creation, the creation of a Europe that is culturally divided more than it was at least more in name than it was before the 16th century. I think that is a relevant thing. And, 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 and I think you added also the, the great schism in, in, in the 11th century. Right? Uh, that's something that is not really discussed, at least in the Netherlands. I don't think that in a lot of other Western uh, countries that is the big issue. But I think that's also a big part in, 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 in the cultural diversity in Europe. Right? Yes. Uh, I see some other questions by Laura. Uh, I wonder if the activities could be designed different according to the student ages. Early secondary students could be interested more about facts and other students about interpretations. In my country, topics are studied twice. Uh, in, in, in my country as well, um, I, I would suggest that the, the difference between the different age groups in the Netherlands would not be that we would stick more to the facts in, in the lower secondary classes, but we would uh, make the uh, interpretations less complex. So we would leave out a lot of elements so that they would not um, have to combine too much information. That I think would be the main difference between the two. But more and more in the Netherlands, uh, even in the lower secondary classes, interpretation uh, as the main object of history is becoming, becoming uh, quite, quite, quite normal. Yeah. But I'm not sure which country you're from, but, but in the Netherlands, that, that is more or less where we're heading to more of an interpretive history teaching. Romania, okay. But I think, I think that it could be done with, with, with facts, but the, the, the fact that you need to compare would also uh, always make them interpret the, 
the differences. Right? So I think that you could could try to put facts on a on a on a on a on a on a, on a, on a, on a timeline that is perfectly okay. Um, and you might say, okay, but how does this develop from that? And do you think it's an improvement or do you think it is a decline? I think it could be done with facts, but but every time you say, but do you think it is more of an improvement or a decline? That in itself might be an interpretation, but maybe in, indeed a, a, a less complicated interpretation than what we have done here. <laughs> what is a fact? <laughs> okay. I, I see Uta raising her hand. Again, uh, I think um, talking about interpretations, isn't it also an issue about uh, creating historical narratives? Um, so what narratives do we, uh, do we create and how is that connected to perspectives? And um, because I think in the end for students, it's all about perspectives and we have the facts, but how do we interpret them and what narratives do we create and uh, what criteria do we use in order to evaluate whether something is more significant some, than something else? So, um, and I think this awareness of um, this, let's say it on a metacognitive level, uh, that history really is more a question of, of narratives and what narratives do we create? And, and that links very clearly to interpretations. And this awareness that you can look at events from very different perspectives and, um, and in the end come up with very different uh, assessments of historical developments yeah. and therefore also the not to say that everything is relative and that everything is everything goes but to have and at least to have a certain awareness of different his, historical perspectives and how history can be evaluated differently i think that's a very important thing and um yeah being aware of this uh creation of narratives I think it's very, very important, especially now uh, at the time of fake news, um, loaded words, uh, creating alternative truths or alternative re um, re realities. I think it's very, very important to be aware that we have different perspectives and that history in the end is a, is, is, is a man-made creation. It's, 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 um, it's, diff it's, it's, yeah, it's narratives from different points of views. I think that's a very, very, very relevant point within most uh, European societies. Right? There are a lot of narratives our students will encounter, either in, in, in regular media or in social media, narratives are everywhere, right? Um, the choice we might have as history teacher but that's dependent on the national curriculum. I think there are a lot of different uh, curricula, different types of curricula within, within Europe. But I think that one of the main stories is would we try to tell them a story of how history happened or would we try to teach them the tools to discern valid narratives from non-valid narratives. Right? As, I, I, as, I, as I tell my students, I teach them some topics on, on philosophy of history. I said, there, there is, no one true answer right answer in history but there are definitely false ones right so there are narrative there are multiple narratives may may be valid but we do have invalid narratives and can we discern those narratives that actually are not plausible because they're not logical they don't they don't uh, incorporate the right evidence and sources and so forth um but and i'm not i don't know how you experience that all over europe uh, i find that especially my higher high school students at right, the secondary school um, prefer a set narrative just tell me what to memorize then i can know what you're going to ask me on the test and then trying to teach them thinking skills is a very difficult but it, it, it can be done but it's, it's difficult because then they feel insecure because they don't know beforehand what the right answer is Right? And they're trained to look for the right answer. And you say, but there's no right answer. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't have the total knowledge. Please make up your own mind. 
right? And that that's that's difficult. They they get they get they get scared because they want to do well on the test. And so that is, I, I think you raise a valid point. I think that is a valid. I think that's an important uh, task for us as history teachers. I, in my own experience, it's one of the more difficult tasks, right? Because they tend to think quite unschooled, uh, and that that's also a safe place in a way. Yeah. So so yeah, valid. We have problems with fake historians, especially from medieval history. Okay, it says Nicola. Yeah, uh, I think that that is a problem we share in, in, in all over Europe, that we have uh, historians who try to uh, embellish the national history. Right? Uh, but again, we as history professional historians and history teachers, we, we are the ones who need to, to address those issues. So I think that's, a, yeah. I think I think that even in the Netherlands we have the same problem with that, and and I'm not saying that the Netherlands is that much to add. Don't 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 understand me wrong, but I think that's something we share. Thank you very much. Okay. Without going into the discussion of what a fact is, because that's a very philosophical question, and that could take forever. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I uh, want to thank you for your attention, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you for a number of great points that could really improve this, uh, this activity. I will try to look into that after my grading is done, maybe even after my, my, my summer break. But uh, I think as historian te history teachers, as teachers, you probably would have your, your own share of grading to do next, next couple of months, weeks. So uh, uh, good luck with that. Please stay safe, uh, especially with the, the corona situation. Stay healthy. And uh, I hope to see you sometime in, in, in the flesh, in real life. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. I will uh, send a follow-up email, of course, with all the links and everything that we discussed. And uh, thank you for your thought-provoking question. It's really great to, to have everyone online, uh, even though, you know, it's Wednesday and even though it's late, it was really so nice to have this discussion. So thank you truly.